Well, good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to be with each and every one of you today. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was, there, is, there is a ton of stuff going on. I'm grateful to be a part of a, a group of believers where, where you know, it's, there's so much more than just what happens on, on a Sunday. And, uh, and so thanks, Alicia, for walking us through uh, all, all of that. Um, just so you know, like sometimes things happen in first service that don't always happen in second. Like it's not all totally like robotic uh, in the way that it happens. And, and she had some references to like a superhero costume and a broom and just things were happening beforehand. Anyways, um, you should ask Alicia about the superhero costume. And anyways, you should do that. I don't know. I need to pray for myself right now. <laughs> Please, actually, join me as we pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for this good day. Thank you that you are a God who sees and hears. Thank you, God, for the gift of forgiveness. That even as we as we lift up, lifted up our voices and, and expressed gratitude back for that reality, God, that, that that's an ongoing thing for us. Lord, not only have you forgiven us much already, but you continue to forgive. And, and, and Lord, as we understand uh, the nature of grace, God, it, it doesn't stop until this life is, is done. Thank you, God, that you not only forgive, but that you change us that you're doing a good work in us, Lord, that the thing that you began in us, uh, it's, it's not stopping until it goes all the way, all the way until completion. So Lord, give us clean hearts, give us soft and, and, and malleable souls. Help us to see like you see and to hear what you have to say to us. God, the things that we've carried with us this week, the things that are burdening us even this morning, Lord, we, we set them down into your capable hands. Lord, not that we would forget, but rather that we would find ourselves walking in a, in a new way through this life. Speak to us now in power and in grace. Amen. So uh, <laughs> we're picking right back up here into the, uh, into the series we're doing on the, on the book of Exodus. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Chuck uh, talked to you uh, well about um, the things in most of, of chapter 2, and I'm going to finish out chapter 2 and bring us into chapter 3. Last week, we talked about just the sanctity of, of humanity, the sanctity of life, this thing that God has given us, and, and, and it's, it should be celebrated and honored and cherished and fought for, and all of those, all of those things are a part of our human or our Christian expression uh, back to God in, in, in a really good way. Um, as we come to the text this, this morning, um, oh, I've got to do this thing. I had too many things going on in my hands earlier. Um, uh, we're encountering God, and, and it's really talking about <clears throat> uh, the call of Moses in, into ministry. Um, by the way, um, it just, it's, it's important that we, that we, we just recognize that, that we're engaging not with just with the story of Moses, but with the story of the people of Israel. And more than that, we're encountering God's story. And it's true for them back then, and it's true for us now. That any time we're talking about history, any time we're talking about things from the past, or even uh, talking about our own testimonies, we're, we're not just telling my story or yours. We're talking about God's story. And, and God ought to be right the, the centerpiece, the protagonist, the, the one that, that we look to as the ultimate hero of, of what's taking place. And that's true in our text uh, this morning as well. So we're here, and, 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 and hopefully we're putting ourselves a little bit into Moses' sandals, so to speak. We're putting ourselves in his shoes and, and, and allowing ourselves that gift of, of being able to encounter God, hopefully in a, in, in, a, in a good way, in a new way. I know many of you have uh, read this text before, long before we got to this series, uh, and so there can be that tendency for us to go like, I, hey, I know the rest of the story, and, and that's good, but let's be in the moment as much as we can and just take in uh, what's, what's, what's happening in, in the story. So we begin here at the end of chapter 2 at verse 23. 
where it says, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. And if you kind of just remember back a little bit, it wasn't, you know, in, if you're just kind of flipping pages, you can go back to the left just a few pages and you're, you're reading about Joseph and you're reading about all that took place and, and the way that, that God brought um, his people into the land of Egypt and there was favor uh, with Pharaoh and they were living in the land of Goshen and they, they were thriving and God had promised uh, to them that, that their people would increase and all of that took place in, in that context. Context and, and, and things were well with, with the people of Israel and, and the people of Egypt. And all of that happened and then things shifted along the way. And we had a new king in Egypt who forgot you know, the old stuff. And, it, and he just kind of moved on and was like, well, who are these people? And oppression came in and slavery came in. All of that happened. Their world changed from, from something that was awesome and life-giving. And, and all of that was, and oppression took place. Slavery took place, and it was difficult for them. And so during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. I just want us to reflect on this idea that God hears and sees. God hears and sees. The Israelites found themselves in harm's way and understandably cried out to God, (laughs) probably for a long time. That little line there at the beginning, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. You you know, there's there's no sense here in the text that that the Israelites cried out to God on a Tuesday and on Thursday, God responded. (laughs) And sometimes it's like that for you, and sometimes it's like that for me, that there's, there's something happening in our lives that's difficult, and it, it feels, maybe it's not slavery per se, maybe it's not oppression quite in that way, but there's, a, there's an ongoing conflict uh, that, that resides in, in us. There's been this thing that you've been pleading with God for for a long time. Some of you have been praying for months about something, and it hasn't happened yet. Some of you have been praying for maybe even years or perhaps decades. In the context of the people of Israel, it seems like it wasn't even just decades, but centuries. Of crying out to God and saying, God, where are you? God, would you help us? Groaning out to the Lord and and, and perhaps wondering if God was there or if he was, did he hear them? Did he know what was happening? Did he care? During that long period, since we can read ahead, we know that rescue will come for them. And in the context of our story, it happens fairly soon. There's still some stuff that needs to take place, but it's, it's on its way. Uh, and, but in the moment and, and on the daily, uh, life can feel pretty bleak. Things can feel kind of grim and, and dim. But throughout this passage, we see repeated time and again that God is watching and listening. The Israelites groaned. Their cry went up to God. They they called out to him because of their slavery. And I love that in verse 24, it's just very, very clear. God heard their groaning. Later on in 25, God looked on the Israelites. He was concerned about them, but it wasn't just this gaze from a distance. It wasn't just this curiosity about these people who were going through a hard time. God remembered. That's the second piece that comes to us here uh, in this passage that God remembers. By the way, we shouldn't think that somehow God might have uh, or even could have forgotten (laughs) the way that we do. It's not like he had, you know, like a brain lapse and somehow managed to forget. I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you watch a movie or read a book again for the first time. You know when you're about 45 minutes in or so, and you're like, you know, I think I remember this. That's a, that's a case of the forgetter kicking in. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and, and just that's it's part of our human experience. And, and we just we have those moments. I, I, again, I, I, I've searched the house. Maybe you have too, looking for your keys or your phone that you just set down two minutes ago. Or it turns out they're in your pocket. Where, where'd my glasses go? 
right? I mean, for crying out loud, like we just, we have absent-mindedness and sometimes we actually even like, not just forget in that kind of way, but we forget things that happened in the past. There are times we're talking about stories and, 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 and Tina, my wife, will be talking about something and she's like, hey, do you remember that? I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't. And, and, and it's just part of what happens with us. Um, you walk into a room to get something, you can't remember why. That's way too often. They tell me there's a reason for that, and I don't care because it still happens and it bugs me. <laughs> but God's not like that. It's not as though he had a momentary lapse of, of an in, or an inability to recall the information that, that had taken place beforehand. It's not as though he had made this covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and then was like, nah, you know that thing that I said back then? Forget about it. If I were from New York, I could say that differently in a more cool way, but forget about it. That's terrible. It wasn't that either. It wasn't that he had done this thing and then set it aside and was like, ah, never mind. It's not that kind of, of, of thing that took place. In fact, we shouldn't think, forget at all when we, see that, say, when, when we see that God remembers. When God remembers his covenant, what's taking place is he's like, yeah, I made this covenant with these people and I'm listening to their cries and I see they're in pain and I see their oppression and I see that it, life is difficult for them and I haven't forgotten about you. I care deeply about these people and I am going to manifest my will through them. I will accomplish my purposes in and through these people. It's part of my plan. He is remembering his covenant with them. He hears their cry. He hears their groan, and he will respond. God remembers. He is concerned deeply about his people and consequently the actions he will take in just a few pages uh, will, will happen as a result of God seeing, God hearing, God remembering, and God acting, responding to the thing that the people were experiencing. I hope that encourages you this morning. That as you continue to bring certain things before the Lord, things that seem like they are not changing, things that seem as though they are unmovable, that God hears you, God sees you, and he is concerned about who you are as a person. How will God respond? I don't know. I don't know. Moving into chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire and did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Hmm. God invites. You know, when we look at this text, it's, it's fascinating to me. <laughs> we know that God will sometimes confront us when, when that is required, and, but Moses experienced that part as well. But, but here we see that God uh, uh, appeared to him, and, and, and how, how did all of that work? There's this, there's this peaking of Moses' interest that God engages in. I think it's very, very intentional. Now, by the way, you can look at the text, and, and there's room here for us to, to within the parameters of, of what the Scriptures say and what the Scriptures don't say, to kind of speculate a little bit about what was taking place now, in terms of when like, the fire started burning. Mount Horeb is, is most likely also Mount Sinai. It's just kind of two different names. There's a regional thing going on there. And, and there, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more here in just a second. But there's this thing about God appearing as fire to Moses. And then later he'll appear as fire on the mountain to the, to the people of, of God when, when deliverance is happening. But, but as, as we look at what's, what's happened, like, was that fire always there? And Moses just was spiritually unaware or just didn't have eyes to see? I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not sure that that's true, but, but I know that sometimes for me it's true. <laughs> that sometimes God is doing a thing, but I'm just a little bit obtuse. I don't know if anybody else can relate to being a little obtuse at times. 
That God is doing this thing and, and, and wanting to engage me and, and for whatever reason I'm not seeing it. And, and, and yet it may just simply be that God appeared right then and there. That, that the phenomenon of, 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 the, of the bush that, that was on fire but not being consumed by the fire. That all of that had just happened and it was grabbing Moses' interest. By the way, uh, one of my Old Testament professors said, hey, when you look at the, at the kind of the word for the, for the bush that's there that's not burning up, he said, it's, it's probably like a blackberry bush. <laughs> Which for me brings up more questions. Because if I have a blackberry bush that isn't being consumed by the fire, I'm like, God, why not? <laughs> Nonetheless. Nonetheless, there's this, this thing that's happening, and, 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 so, and, and Moses is, is intrigued, and, and he, comes, he comes back, and, and, and he's like, what, what's going on? Why isn't it burning up? We're fascinated by fire, aren't we? You start a fire, like a little campfire, and, and, and you can be sitting around that thing, and, and really not even, you can be talking a fair bit, or not talking, but I know for me, I'm like, I just like watching the wood burn. And I imagine it was a little bit like that for Moses, that he's out there doing his shepherding thing. <laughs> and he sees the fire, and, and it kind of takes a little while before he realizes that the bush isn't being consumed by the fire. He's watching the flames flicker and getting curious and, and noticing eventually that, that nothing was actually burning. And, and so he comes closer. Why? Because I think God set it up that way. He's, he's piquing his interest. He's piquing his curiosity. So church, I have a question for you. Are you curious about God? Does God fascinate you? Or have you figured him out? <laughs> the nervous laughter I'm hearing is... Somewhat reassuring. I wonder if he isn't doing things that ought to make us stop and look to see what exactly in the world is going on. I also want to pull us out of the text for just a moment and over into the book of Hebrews chapter 12. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 talks about uh, the mountain of God and he talks about it, it's kind of couched there, the little, the little caption says mountain of fear and the mountain of joy. And the writer of Hebrews reflects back, not maybe to this exact moment, but to this experience when, when, uh, when the people are there and, and they're gathered and, and the, the presence of God is on, on Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And, 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 he, and he says to the people, verse 18, he says, you have not come to a mountain that can be, or excuse me, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. And that's kind of the situation back then. We see the, uh, the holiness of God on display, and it's powerful. By the way, when I think about uh, Moses and the burning bush, that experience, sometimes I want that. You know what I mean? Sometimes I want that moment, that, that moment when, when God reveals himself in such a mysterious and beautiful and unmistakable way that I know that it's God and, and that he's talking to me with, with that kind of clarity and, and language that it's almost like an, an epiphany, but more real than that, that there's, there's this tangibleness to all of what's taking place. <laughs> And yet the writer of Hebrews pulls us back into the reality that we have now, which I think is far better, uh, even if it is different. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion, right? To the city of the God, of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, this new thing that God has done. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Church, we may not be having burning bush experiences, but we have been given the Spirit of God. We have been given this new covenant. Our, our sins, as we already sang about uh, this morning, have been forgiven and will be forgiven uh, as we confess them to the Lord. 
We come not to a mountain afraid for our lives, but rather received as children of the Most High God. Romans 8 is very clear about it, that, that if you have like, confessed your sins and received that gift of, of life that is ours in the Lord, uh, you have nothing to be afraid of when you come into the presence of God, holy though he is, powerful though he is, awesome though he is. Why? Because by his spirit we can call out, Daddy, Abba, Father, it's a spirit of sonship and it's extended to all who believe and, and we're included in that promise and so the presence of God isn't any longer about I, I, I'm scared for my life right now. The presence of God means I am welcomed, accepted, and filled with the joy that comes to me through the spirit of the Lord. God invites us into that relationship. How does God appear to us today? He appears to us in a totally new way. And and, and again, while we find uh, the story of the burning bush is is amazing and it should be amazing to us, that we ought to be caught up in the wonder of a fire that does not consume the bush, the gift that we have been given is far greater than that. So I hope that you hear that. By the way, the end of that passage uh, in Hebrews says this. This is verse 28 of, of chapter 12. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Church, does that, how does that feel for you? You're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Because I've got to tell you, I have things in my world that shake. You know what I'm saying? And some things ain't supposed to shake. Like, I don't expect the mountain to shake, but sometimes it does. And sometimes the mountain becomes violent and erupts. And sometimes the ground itself splits apart and shakes and causes all kinds of damage. And sometimes there are institutions that we tend to hang our hats on that aren't as solid as we'd like them to be. And when those seemingly unshakable objects or immovable foundations, when those things begin to crumble and we're trying to make sense of our world, we need to come back to this idea that the kingdom that we are receiving that is from God is unshakable. It cannot be moved. So when you lift your eyes up to the mountains and ask, where does your help come from? It doesn't come from the mountains, y'all. (laughs) <laughs> mountains fall down. It comes from God. It comes from the creator of, of heaven and earth. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. May his will be done in our lives and in our world. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. (laughs) God calls. Now that God has Moses' attention, he starts to talk to him, to tell him about the place that he is, where he is, and and the nature of it, that it is, in fact, holy ground, and who he is talking to. If I were in Moses' spot, I, I know I'd be curious. I would do the same thing that he did. I would approach the fire. I'd be curious about what's what's taking place. And then God just talks to him and he gets his attention. Moses, Moses, stop it. Was Moses doing something wrong? No, not necessarily, but God's warning him. He's protecting him. He's saying, look, the place that you're standing is holy ground. Take off your sandals. Demonstrate here that this place is holy. Show that, 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 that respect. And, and it's, it's, I think, not just a warning to like, not break the rules, so to speak, but for Moses' own protection. to save his life, likely, and, and to, for Moses to understand and appreciate that, that the God who he is having a conversation with is holy, is different. And he talks to him in a way that, that he would have recognized, I'm not just some random, 
an identifiable being. I am the God of your forefathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is who I am. I am your God, and, and it's, it's, it's there for him. It seems to me like this first encounter is a precursor to the relationship God would have with Moses and with the people. The contrast between God's holiness and the people's lack of understanding, sometimes sort of innocently and sometimes willful ignorance. <laughs> But God is there, and he begins to call him and talk to him. And, and as, as, as this happens, Moses, it says he, he hides his face because he's afraid to look at God. Why? Because God is powerful. As we've talked about this idea of, that comes to us from Hebrews and other places in Scripture, by the way, that, that we get to enter the throne room and we get to enter by the, by the, by the grace of God, the shed blood of, of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and, and we can come in and we're free to do so and we're invited to do so and we ought to. We, we also need to remember, I think, that God is holy and that without the covering of Jesus, we'd be in Moses' spot. And we need to hide our face. The Lord continues to talk to Moses. He says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land. A land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God rescues. God rescues. And that's the, you know, maybe the most encouraging thing is that, that in the midst of all of this waiting, in the midst of all of the, of the oppression that they experienced, that, that God not only saw them and heard them and was concerned about them, but God did something in response. That God saw their plight and, and he says to, to Moses, I, I hear what's going on, I see what's going on, and I'm choosing you. I, I'm going to send you uh, to, to, to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, uh, out of Egypt. Again, it's not just curiosity from a distance. He cares about them, uh, and he has specifically come down to rescue them from their oppressors, and not just to rescue them, but to bring them into that new land, that new land that is flowing with milk and honey. It's not just a rescue mission. It's a deliverance mission, not just from something, but to something. You know that that same thing is true for us as believers, Amen. That we're not just rescued from darkness, but we are brought into light. That we're not just saved from certain death and condemnation, but we're brought into life and into freedom. That we get to rejoice in all that God is doing for us, and, and, and we all have a part to play for this. And Moses, for, for him, it's kind of a moment, um, some might say he was voluntold, right? God didn't say like, hey, I need a volunteer to lead my people, who wants in? No, he just appointed Moses. You're the one. You're the one that I want. A better word would be commissioned, by the way. It was a positive thing. He was commissioned into this work. He was assigned for the task. He was made for the task. Uh, and by the way, so are you. So are you. Scripture is very clear that, that each of us is created by God. Ephesians 2.10 is, is, is just, it's a life-giving verse for me personally, but it, it reminds me that, that each of us are, in fact, God's workmanship, it says. God's masterpiece. We're, we're, we're like a beautiful, dynamic dance to him that, that, that in all of creation, he has caused humanity to be the thing that he has poured himself into, and, and he has designed us not to be just rescued from depravity and despair and all that stuff, but to walk in the good works that he has prepared prepared in advance for us to do. So God's called each of us. Your task will be different than Moses' task. Your task will be different than my task. Mine is different than yours. But walk in the thing that God has called you to walk in. Uh, you may be part of something. You are part of something bigger than yourself. God rescues. And that thing that you've been praying about for months, years, decades... God knows about that too. God knows about that too. I'm going to invite our musicians to come up. 
and to close us out. But as they do, I, w- I want us to engage with this a, a little bit more. How, how can we encounter God today? Moses encountered God in a powerful way there at the burning bush. And, and by the way, as he's commissioned. We'll get to Moses' response to God's commissioning next week. That's a whole other deal. How does God show up today? If we believe that we're, we're being introduced not to Mount Sinai, but to Mount Zion, if we believe that we've been ushered into this new kingdom, this new covenant uh, that's filled with joy and with grace and forgiveness, that, that we're welcomed into the presence of God, how does that translate now on the daily? How, how do we encounter God? How, how does it take place? And sometimes there are things that are unique to us in our own experiences, but I do think that there are There are spots in our lives or there are experiences in our lives, things that we can do where we can pretty much count on God showing up, if that makes sense. Uh, Not in a uh, rubbing the lamp and having the genie appear kind of way, but just it seems like God shows up time after time after time when we do certain things. The first first thing, and by the way, I'm going to say some of these things and some of you are going to be like, Pastor, I've heard that. Because you sound just like that. I'm sorry. (laughs) To which I will respond, I know. (laughs) That's why I'm reminding you. God shows up in Scripture. God shows up in Scripture. And just so we understand it, I believe that Scripture was written with very specific messaging and intent to a very specific audience in its original context. That each Scripture, like it was, it was, you know, written and read and all that. Very specifically. But it's not a stagnant ancient document. It's God breathed. Paul writes to Timothy all scripture is what? God breathed and useful for a variety of things that enhance our lives. And it's not just about like self improvement, it's about having an encounter with God. And so the document isn't just a dead document. It's it's a living document in in the sense that God speaks to us through it. The Spirit is active in the Scriptures. And and, and where we we need to be careful a little bit and not believe for a second that that all of that Scripture was written just for me personally. (laughs) Like I get to choose how I receive it all. (laughs) But... As we engage with the text, we can see that God is talking to us. And, and so when you are reading through scriptures and you feel like, oh, the Lord is talking to me, he's encouraging me in a certain way or dealing with something in my life in a particular way, listen to that because that's the spirit using the scripture to talk to you. You are having an encounter with God. Turns out God uses people, regular old people, <laughs> to talk to us. You can have an encounter with God through someone else. My experience, by the way, has been, for the most part, they don't know that God's using them to talk to me. Most of the time, it's not, brother, I have a word of the Lord for you. (laughs) Not that there aren't moments like that. Most of the time, we're talking about how we're connecting with God, and we're relating our stories to each other, and God's present in those things. So we need each other. Why? Because the Spirit of God is active in every one of us. If each of us have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Sonship in us, then we should expect that we're going to hear from God through one another. We can encounter God today through other believers. And then finally, just very directly, God speaks to us through His Spirit. And we've already kind of been talking about this, but I just want to acknowledge that there are times when God's talking to you in your dreams. That stuff happens. Don't discount the messages that come to you uh, in, in those moments. Uh, sometimes God will give you a, a, a word, and it's, it, it may be audible, it may, it may not. When, when you pray, leave silence in your prayer so you can listen to God. Pray in such a way that you're not distracted. Pray in such a way that you're not doing 14 other things while you're praying. Now, you can pray while you're doing 14 other things. I'm just saying, you need some time where you're just quiet before God. And maybe God will speak clearly to you in that moment, and maybe he won't, but you keep coming back. The Spirit of God is alive and active and desires to lead you and guide you in truth. Jesus promised us this Spirit, this Spirit, one who comes alongside, this one who seals us, 
the one who marks us as belonging to Christ, the one who gives us that spirit of sonship, and the one who counsels and guides us. So listen to the Spirit of God. I've said enough. Father in heaven, thank you for this good day. Thank you, God, uh, that we get to encounter you in the context of this new covenant, this covenant of grace. Thank you, God, for the forgiveness of sins. God, I pray for each and every one of us in the room, Lord, that, that we would find ourselves more and more not being drawn to the miraculous, but being drawn to you. God, we believe that only you can truly change each and every one of us, and so we ask for that to happen. God, as we go from this place, as we, as we lift our voices up here one, one more time, would you fill us? Remind us of who you are. God, remember your people here at Waypoint. Do that good work in us. Thank you, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen.